thank you. You know, being at the Royal Free for 48 years, um, you're supposed to look in disbelief, um, which you're not, so it must mean that I look like I've worked here for 48 years. But never mind, I shall, I've failed. But I started when I was 16, and um, I have a passion for the Royal Free, uh, which will be endless. Uh, everybody says, well, when are you going to retire? But uh, no, I don't. Uh, they might find me dead at my desk one day, but you know, we'll worry about that another time. Um, yeah, so I know you've heard some of the history, and I did run the rec club for 26 years, the recreation club, which is now supported by the charity. And I trained as a therapist then. And the reason I did was staff, tired, exhausted, um, stressed, would come into the building. And I thought, I, I could do something about this. I could actually um, learn to massage, and we could calm them all down. So that was the idea. Never intended to see a patient, ever. That was not my idea. Um, and then one day, Alison Jones, one of our oncologists, said, would I see a patient? And I thought, well, I, you know, I've never thought of that. But yeah, I'll, I'll see a patient. And that was the start. Um, and that was, obviously, 21 years ago now. And I had immense hostility from other consultants. Do not touch my patients. Don't go near my patients. I don't like this alternative stuff. Then they noticed that Alison's patients were much more comfortable and much more rested than their patients. And um, so eventually, the hostility went away. And they thought, well, you know, I'll try him out. And it's all about trust. I was known at the free, and I think that gave me that advantage that they trusted my, my ways of, of seeing a patient, knowing that it would be gentle, that you couldn't have me without normal medicine. That was a, a big thing, so it was never going to be alternative because you don't go down the alter, you know, if you go down the alternative route, you don't have traditional medicine as well. So, you know, it, it was a, a difficult time, and, and I must admit, it was, I never thought that we'd get to where we are now. Um, with the levels of patients that we see in all disciplines. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond my dreams. Um, I, I did, uh, when, when I was a volunteer, because I was running the rec club as well as volunteering on the wards when I saw the first patient, and I did that for eight years. But running the rec club and doing about 60 hours there and then working 24 hours on the wards doing patients, something had to give. And unfortunately, the voluntary bit didn't pay the mortgage. So um, I did say to the Royal Free, look, you need to find somebody full time. You need to uh, really specialize on this and do it properly. Um, I gave them six months to actually find some, somebody or some money. Well, they took it to five months and 26 days and phoned me up and said, we found some money. We've got some money. Um, and, and from that, that point, I said, well, look, you know, I'm happy at the rec club. Let's hand it over. And then I thought, you know, I actually love this. I so love this work. Um, the salary was never going to be what I was already earning, but, you know, suddenly money doesn't really matter when you can make a big difference, as, as you, you will hear later in the, in the talk, of how we make a difference to a patient's day. And it, that really got to me. Um, and I decided I would go for the job, and there were six of us went for the job, and I was, I was successful. I think they gave me a harder interview than anybody else so that they didn't think it would ever be a personal thing that you were already doing it. Um, but I was happy to, to do it, which then enabled me to take on volunteers. So I started with three volunteers, uh, and it was funny enough, it was a therapist that I'd trained um, because I ended up working for Claire Maxwell Hudson after I qualified. And I trained some of these therapists because they came to me for work placement. Now, the trouble with hospital massage is that it gets very passionate. Um, unfortunately, it's very addictive, too. And over the years, we've had volunteers, and we still have volunteers. But because of the level of patients now, the, the, unfortunately, the voluntary labor wasn't as reliable as having somebody paid to come in. Um, and a, a lovely patient who, unfortunately, is not with us anymore, was a young man who was a self-made millionaire. And he said, we need a duplicate Keith. I'm going to give you some money. And he, he gave me £12,000 to start off paying some therapists. And 
that's when I thought, hmm, if somebody's going to give me £12,000 to start, then maybe other people will give. So I started letter writing. Um, now, over the, the past three years, we've risen to 21,000 treatments. Last year was the top. It went up to 25,000 treatments. Now, obviously, that's not individual patients, it's treatments. So if somebody's in for three months, they might get one every day. And if you've got um, a, a, either an oncology, a, a cancer or a leukemia, to have that visit each day is, is worth its weight in gold. It's, it's away from medicine. Um, they can talk, they can not talk if they don't want to. It's a variant. variance. It's like somebody coming through into the room that doesn't remind them of their illness. Um, unfortunately, doctors and nurses have to do that because they have to give you the drugs, they have to um, assess your blood pressure, what have you. We come in and we're a different ball game because we're there and hence why I, I always say it's a treat. Um, we've already had a conversation with one of the young ladies who really does think it's a treatment and I agree in both cases it is. Um, so when, when all the me medical team sanctioned, they started getting jealous because I only did oncology first and then I got the haematologist saying, well, hold on, what about my patients? So it then became busier and busier. Then the neurologist said, what about our patients? Then the renal dialysis people said, what about our patients? And this is how it's gone on and on and on. And we've, we've gathered every discipline of medicine now. Now, I mean, the, the worry um, that we had is that obviously the team is not big um, and trying to keep... Uh, we have to have a priority of patients that we know makes a massive difference on the day. And then we have the other ones that it's, it's a treat. We're not a spa, so we're not going to say we'll be there at 10 o'clock. We can't say that. We would be there sometime in the morning. Um, but So this goes to all patients, whether they're private, whether they're NHS, it's immaterial to us. They are a patient and they need some care. So um, the only difference happened about three years ago when the government decided that we needed peer reviewing, that, that you know, it needed put into um, a, a partition in some ways to make sure that good practice was happening, which I would never disagree with. Um, so they brought in regulations of how we work, which was exactly how we were working anyway, but they added some things like, um, obviously each therapist has to be uh, professionally uh, indemnified by their own insurance. They also have to be indemnified by a registered body, which is like any doctor, any nurse would have to be a member of the GNC or nursing council. So these were all things we already did. Then CRB checks, which I totally agree with, once again, that the therapist that's come into your bed has been police checked and that, that you know that they are a good uh, figure of society. They then th brought in um, saying if anybody has any uh, oncology or uh, sorry, a leukemia or a tumour, then they have to do a consent form. Now this causes a problem because you would not believe how many times we're called for needle phobics, somebody that's scared of needles and they're going through a cancer. And if you suddenly walk in with a form to say, while they're being hysterical seeing the needle and saying I'm not going through with this chemo, it became a difficulty. Now, that's the one time that we don't all... They have to consent before treatment. That's the only time we've got a, a sort of a, a levy to say, no, we can't do that. You know, you'd only make the person hysterical even more. So we just wait at an opportune moment after uh, the chemo's been administered and then we do the consent. But it, it just, you know, when you have to say to a patient on the consent form, this massage is not instead of your chemo or your radiotherapy or your surgery, you do feel a bit of a twit because, you know, anybody with uh, one brain cell would know that it can't compete, that the, your massage can't compete against some of the wonderful things that the, the medicine can do now to get rid of tumours. So that's the only change. But it was all, all brought in for litigation. Obviously, we have gone down the American route. They're all frightened of litigation. So as it is, you know, once the, the initial paperwork started, it's just now we carry on doing the same work as we did after the consent. It's the only patients that we have to consent, so we don't have to consent care of the elderly. Dementia would be a problem anyway, trying to get somebody to sign a form that, has a, that is in stages of dementia. 
So they, that, that's, you know, the only thing I would say is a, is a, a sort of a, a sad thing that I think they've made more of what we do in the sense of litigation than, 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 than we actually do. Um, the only way that this will continue in all hospitals is safe practice. Um, I, I think my therapists are absolutely brilliant on the wards. The, the, the actual washing of hands, every procedure that happens in this place, they adhere to. And because we know that complementary therapists would be the first person they'd think, oh, I bet they don't do this and I bet they don't do that. My staff are impeccable in, in their hygiene aspects because they see all different patients in all different areas of, of, of the wards. Um, it's educating the staff of the usefulness of us was actually has been more difficult than anything else um, because they have to fill a form in. That form takes two minutes. I'd done a form that was so easy and that's probably the only difficult part of getting a patient on our list quickly. We guarantee somebody that we've had a referral for we will see within 24 hours, which I think is an unbelievable thing. Obviously, Monday to Friday, we, don't, we aren't here at the weekends. Um, but within that span, I start at 5.30 in the morning. I'm here for pre-op. Um, so anybody that's really nervous, uh, they, can, uh, uh, offer, they can be offered a massage at the crack of dawn before the anaesthetist gets them, just to take the edge off it. Obviously, you're still going to be nervous going through an op, but it's just a nice, lighter way to go through an op. And research has always said that if you go through an operation um, in a placid mood, then um, you are tend to come through the operation much quicker. You're more likely to go home quicker. So obviously that's a saving of national health beds, uh, which is always a problem, whatever hospital it is, wherever it is in this land. But you know, the one thing that we always remember why we are here, um, we are here for that patient. We are not, sometimes the consultant wants the massage for the patient, the nurse wants the massage for the patient, the patient actually doesn't want it. It will never work in a million years. But we always make sure that that patient, before they get the massage, actually is something they want, not that they've been forced on. And I'll tell you a story where one, um, an oncology patient on Levin East once was told by the, their consultant, you must have a massage from Keith. And um, I was sent for and said, look, please do it urgently. She's getting very stressed. So I went there and she held her hand out. She didn't do my hand, so I said, fine. I said, do you really want this massage? She went, no, prove to me it works. <laughs> and the hand was as rigid as that. And I'm working and working and praying and praying. And I don't feel any different. <laughs> OK, keep working, keep working. I still don't feel any different. And then I noticed a little picture of a cat on the side of her bedside cabinet. And I went, oh, what a beautiful cat. She went, oh, that's my Timmy. I miss him so much. <laughs> And you know, I massaged her every day until she passed away. And she absolutely loved it because she loved the chat. It was really nothing. I don't think she ever cared about the massage, but she had me there as a, um, there to do a massage, but to listen to her, she could tell me about her cat. That's half, sometimes that's why I say it's a treat, not a treatment. Because a lot of times, some of the care of the elderly just want a bit of company. When you're 90, you don't get that many visitors because most of your friends are 90. Um, and getting on a bus is quite difficult, or parking your car in this area is even more difficult. So it, it's, it's covered a multitude of sins in, in, the, in the way of um, how we work. And as I say, it's only that the patient definitely wants it. The biggest contraindication, there's not a patient in this building that probably we can't see for any clinical reason, because we can always do. We see patients in ITU, we can do five minutes of doing a gentle movement around the forehead, which will calm somebody down. We have been trying for tonight to get some film of, because the one noticeable difference is if you see uh, the monitors in ITU when we've worked, from about five to six minutes of working on a patient's feet or hands on that, you will see things start developing and dropping the breathing rate, and sometimes we set off alarms because we drop it lower than they think that they could go. So that's the one proven area. And we were trying to get you some film tonight. But unfortunately, you know, choosing the right patient and getting, you know, getting permission and so on and so forth, 
um, beat us this week. But we will do it, so, so watch this space. But that will be the way that you will sit and go, wow, you know, this does work. Um, you know, it is an adjunct. I've always said we are an adjunct to medicine. We're something that's really nice that can happen in your day. So let's have a look at where, hopefully, if I can work this, the world of hospital massage. Um, it can be anywhere. It can be as long as the patient wants it. We do the gift of life. We used to, we, we're going to reintroduce this, um, we used to go on maternity ward the day after somebody had given birth and they, get, they used to get a massage the next day. Just to say thank you for bringing another beautiful baby into this world. We, we haven't got the staff at the moment. It's something we're working on. We're trying to get a tender together to get some funding. But what we do do is anybody that's at risk in pregnancy through high blood pressure or anything, we take those, those patients on. As you can see, this young lady was an at risk um, with high blood pressure. So uh, we will take those on because we will get a referral to say, could we see this patient on a weekly basis? But what we also do is we look after the mums in the prem baby unit. You think you've just given birth and unfortunately you cannot take your baby home. How distressing would that be? And we look after dads as well, because they're going through it as well. And um, it, so that's our use in, in maternity at the moment. We do eating disorders in adolescence. It's a very difficult subject because one minute I could be looking after somebody on an oncology ward that is fighting to stay alive. And then literally 20 minutes later, I can see a young lady of 13 or 14 that is actually trying to kill themselves. And it's a really strange balance to have. But it's been so effective because we're not medical. And I, and I make that quite clear when we go in. We're called in, obviously, by the psychs. Um, I work with either a mother or father or a nurse together for, for obvious reasons because they're mostly female, very vulnerable ages, 14 to 16. We only take um, here, we only have a, ch a child uh, Adolescent, we have an adolescent department for eating disorders, not a, an adult. Um, they're very manipulative. You have to be, you think you've cracked the, the, where they're going wrong and they will lie, they will cheat, they will do everything. And when you see a child with one grain of rice in their hand going like that, it's, I've got grandchildren, I think, oh my God, how the parents are going through it, it's a very difficult situation. But we've had a real great success. And in fact, I still see one who's 24 now. I saw her when she was 14. She's at uh, Oxford doing medicine. Um, and, you know, she took it to the limit. She took it to that she crashed and was in ITU and had to be resuscitated and was in ITU for three months. But thank God she pulled herself together. She's got a lovely boyfriend. And as I say, she's studying medicine. So it has had its successes. But things like how they are manipulative, they will, while you're doing the massage, will do that. They're burning calories. They know that what they're doing. And that's the sort of thing we can actually stop and say, no, we won't carry on with your massage if you're going to continue that. And they tend to do that. They have, you know, with the nurses, they'll just carry on doing it. With us, I think the massage means more to them. Um, and they stop. So this has been a, a great successful area which is a strange area to be successful in. Right, we, we're very lucky here, because um, obviously the hospital has specialised in some amazing rare gene disorders. Pompey, Wegener's, Wilson's, Fabry, Goucher's and Morcoy. Um, you will see my next slide is my favourite patient, and she's been in today. She's from Austria. She's the most darling. She's 18. Um, we have just such a good time. We have fun, laughter. Um, and today was her last visit because she's been on a drug trial here. And the Royal Free have been so famous for some of the drug trials they've done. They've increased her bone density, which is what this trial was to do. Um, it's a, a, a dreadful disease. I'll, I'll show you. Here she is. And, and I'm showing her. Some Japanese came over and photographed us working together on a massage. And I'm just showing her the Japanese book. But these, her mum took these photos. <laughs> But she is a darling. She never moans. Now, when you're three foot two um, and your legs uh, are 
that size to get up steps you can imagine is, is very difficult. She's in pain, she's deaf uh, or partially deaf. Um, she has a high breast uh, bone which means she's very distorted in the sense of her neck is disappearing. She never moans. She's always got that smile on her face. She's just started a new job and you know and why do I love my job? Because I get to meet people like that who never have a moan in their body. And as I say, it's such a privilege for us to be able to treat patients like that. And we're very lucky at the free because if you look at other hospitals, they don't have the facility to treat anything other than cancer patients or leukemics. They never have an outside order of um, neuro and these sort of disabilities. We do a lot with MS, Guillain-Barre and stroke patients here. Um, as you can see by the legs, we can assist those in the, you can see they're like glass legs, um, which happens in MS. Um, massaging those can actually give them some sensation, which is great. All our work tends to be very gentle. The only time we work a little deeper is with MS, purely because they wouldn't feel the sensation if we did the most gentlest of strokes. Um, once again, you can see how water retention and that glass look on the face. Now, this young lady with MS has been using a hot water bottle on her back. She has to totally taken the epidermis off with overuse of a hot water bottle because this is the problem with MS, is that you don't always feel the pain. Um, she's in constant pain with her back. We see her weekly. She's an outpatient, so she comes in weekly. But so these are the sort of things that we can help with. Oncology. Well, oncology could mean surgery, radio, chemotherapy, or all three. We, um, now, in this hospital, we tend to get them as soon as diagnosis has been made, which is wonderful, because so we can help them through the journey from day one. Um, this can be any form of cancer, whether it be bowel, um, anything in the abdomen, breast, uh, you name it, we would, we would take it on. Um, how our referral form works is we're told by the consultant or doctor or senior reg or reg or the nurse in what areas where we can work. With cancer, we work, and leukemia, we work in a very gentle mood. It's virtually, it's just stroking, no pressure points used, um, otherwise they will bruise. So um, the safety, I, I did some teaching in Canada and I had to go on TV in Canada when uh, a consultant said, aren't you frightened that you will spread the cancer? So I did the, the, the thing I always say to doctors that don't believe in us, is um, do you tell them not to uh, wash? And he goes, well, no. Well, the stroke that we use is the same gentleness of drying yourself with a towel. So there's absolutely no way. And Professor Sakura from uh, the cancer, uh, I think he's Cancer Institute now, um, has always said there is absolutely no um, knowledge that anything of gentle massage, Swedish massage, would ever encourage a cancer to grow. Um, now, cording comes in breast surgery. This is probably the worst cording I've ever, ever seen. And um, this poor lady had, uh, as you can see, it's like looking at an anatomy physiology book, isn't it, with all the muscles. Um, it meant that she couldn't extend any further than there with cording. We, after three weeks' work, we've been working with Alison Jones on this, doing five minutes, no more, five minutes working in an upward stroke towards the heart, very sort of gentle, but just a little bit heavier. We've actually, she can now extend her arm to here. Now, you know, that will go away anyway of its own accord, but it can take up to six months, nine months to do. We've done it in three weeks that she can actually do what she probably would have done in nine months. Hematology. Um, the, the, the greatest use of haematology is that we see a patient every day. It, it, when you have any haematological condition, lots of times you are trapped in your room with a closed sign on your room, which means people have got to come in with gloves and aprons in lots of time, and it feels so, so, you'll feel so detached from being a normal person. The loneliness of a closed room, not allowing the door to be open. You're in a single room, you can't have any another patient chat to you. 
We go every day to those patients. We have two selected therapists that do haematology. And so you've got a continuity of care with, um, with your patient, which is so vital. And if any of you have been in hospital, to see the same person, you don't have to go through discussions of um, how, where, and what, that your, you know, your dilemma. To see the same patient, one day you can be silent, one day you can have a chat. Um, it's, it's something, uh, a certain somebody that's in the audience, I'm not going to mention her name, but she sent me a note last week and saying, I'm so, I'm so happy that I've ever known you. And I thought, oh my God, that's so powerful. And I, I adore her, as she knows. But, you know, it just meant a lot to her that I always appear when she's at her lowest. And her lowest is she's away from her kids, she's away from her hubby, and she's locked in this place. Even though the care is good, I'm not ever doubting that. But it's just being that exclusion of everything. And, and it really is um, a, a very important part. And one haematology patient said to us, you know, it makes even a bad day a bit better. And I think you can't get better than that. Rheumatology, as you can see, this poor lady's hands. Um, we do a lot in rheumatology. We do a heck of a lot in scleroderma. Scleroderma is something I started working with when uh, any of you who know Professor, da no, Dame Professor Carol Black, she was a, a consultant here, and she introduced me. Uh, when I used to work privately, she was one of my clients. And she said to me, oh, I want you to come on Saturday and do some massage on scleroderma patients because it's really good for them. It's a horrible disease. It's, it's, it really is a horrible disease. And I've done now, the, I think, 15 annual days. So I come every year on a Saturday when they have a, uh, a day in this room with their consultants, and the consultants give them updates of um, what's going on with uh, their, the medicine that is, is helping. And there's a lot going on in scleroderma, but there is still no cure. They all come in every six months and have um, this isoprost put, put through them, which opens out the veins. I'm not a, a medical, so I'm not going to go through all the technicalities, but it has made great improvements in these, in these patients' lives. Um, but it's, I think it's £70,000 per patient. And, you know, you just can't comprehend this sort of money. Um, in the health service, but it has made such a difference to people's lives um, because they end up losing digits because there's no circulation. Um, this lady has rheumatoid, so you can see, but I can still do her shoulders, I can still do her hands gently. She's virtually lost the power of holding things in her hand now, um, purely because, as you can see, the joints are so swollen. And that's the thing, we would never do anything that would hurt all our massage would never actually hurt you. There's, you know, none of this, um, oh, you know, if it doesn't hurt, it's not doing any good for you. It's not, it's a really bad theory. <laughs> and don't take any massage therapist that you use privately to say, oh, if I don't go in deep, it will never work. Such a rubbish. Liver transplantation. Um, this young man uh, worked for McLaren, the racing team and while he was away at one of the Grand Prix, he got bit by a bug and that bug went straight to his liver and he had to be rushed back here and had an emergency liver transplant. This guy, if anything could go wrong with somebody's body, it did. He had a stroke during this, he, oh, you name it, he had to have a stoma because his bowel stopped working, you name it, it went wrong. And they called me in ITU because he'd been in the ITU for 30 odd days. And when, they, when a patient's there, they tend to call us to actually try and change uh, something in their day, you know, from lying in a bed in, in ITU. And I used to talk to him, I've got a little house in Norfolk and on the Friday I always used to say to him, oh, I'm going up to Norfolk today. And he said, tell me what it's like there. Because he had totally given up wanting to live anymore. He really had said, I've had enough, I don't like this, I don't like having a stoma bag, I don't like this, don't like that. And it, as I say, he just kept on going into MRSA and varying things like that. Anyway, I used to talk to him about my, my little house in Norfolk and describing what Norfolk was. And, and this is where patients do try and live your, your life in, in a little way. Because they're captured in here, they, they follow through with your, with their own, with your life. And... Anyway, um, as time went on, I, I used to play music in ITU and uh, 
I played him some music which he knew and because I thought it was dead silence in this room and it was dreadful, it was an awful atmosphere and I said, we've got to put some life in it. So I bought him music and I left it there. We are now very, very firm friends. Um, he is now happily married with this young lady. I went to their wedding and they have this beautiful daughter who's nine years old. Um, and about four years ago, he bought me a picture of Norfolk, uh, a painting that he'd had done of Norfolk, and with that little inscription actually embedded into the, into the picture. And you know, it's it sort of these relationships that I've, I've been lucky to have, just, you know, as I, I've always said to people, I have the best job in the hospital, and I really do have the best job in the hospital. Wherever you go, people want to see you, they smile at you. The nurses want their shoulders done for two minutes, so everybody wants to see you. Where, where else could you go wrong? Pain. We run a pain clinic here, um, a small pain clinic here, for some of the people that can't get physio anymore. Um, so it, we do need a referral, but if we, if we can help somebody move on, we do. We used to have a much, um, through funding, I can't do a weekly one. I used to do a weekly uh, pain clinic, but because I haven't got the funds, I now do one a month um, because it is very difficult. But, you know, it's somebody's... And people come in from St Albans for 15 minutes of massage. I mean, you know, which is incredible, and it still baffles me. Um, and, and I will look at the age of, of the audience and say, I must say, the more, more mature person are never late. They never not turn up. It's the younger element that are sent by some GPs that phone me up and say, oh, well, I was at the hairdressers. That's why I didn't turn up. And I go, I thought you was in pain. Well, I am, but the hairdressers won. <laughs> Care of the elderly. We, um, last year, won a tender with the Hampstead and Wells Trust for providing care for care of the elderly with dementia or with um, breaks, i.e. coming care of the elderly and also um, w with a break, a broken arm or a broken leg. We've taken in the last two years from 80 patients to three years ago, sorry, three years ago we did 80 patients in the care of the elderly ward. This year you'll see the figures but it's over 3,000. You know, we've made a massive step. Um, unfortunately, funding runs out in September, but we'll come to that at a later stage. But these are the reasons we're called in for dementia, for fear, for loneliness, for boredom, for worry. All these vital things a massage therapist can help with. Um, it is the, the loneliness, and, um, and as I said to you earlier, if somebody's 90, the, the visiting rate is, is dreadful, especially if they've got no family, if they've got no children, then they've got to rely on friends coming in. And, you know, they tend to be the same age, and it's not easy to get on a bus when you're 90, 92. So we've made a massive ingrain on, on care of the elderly, um, and it, it's just been the most wonderful thing. that These guys have got such incredible stories, and the ladies have. You know, you are talking of real life about the war and about this and that and ration books. Yeah, we watch it on telly, but you get it real life here, and, and they're passionate about telling you some of the tales uh, of, of their youth. Palliative care. The most difficult one, because everybody says to me, oh, I couldn't do that, I couldn't go to care of the dying. It's the most wonderful gift that we have access to. This is, um, this young man, Arvind, was 11. He is the most, or was the most loveliest boy. He had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which, so he had a very short life expectancy. And he was 11 in that photo there. This is him. 13, um, and he had literally three weeks left. He died three weeks afterwards. I saw him every day. He used to come in Saturdays and Sundays. It's the only patient I've ever come in seven days a week for. He smiled at me. He loved his massage. He would tell Porkies to me. He would say, I'd do his arms and I'd do his legs, and he'd say, you've forgotten my arm. Knowing that I'd done it, I could still see the oil on it, and I'd go around, do it again, and you'd see this cheeky smile come round saying, I've conned you. Um, Arvin loved Christmas, and his parents said to me, oh, you know, he's not going to make Christmas. So we had Christmas in July on the ward. Every single person on the ward at, 
did a part of it. We did Santa, we did presents wrapped up, we did mince pies and we sang carols, and we had Christmas music in his, his bay. You know, it was the most fantastic moment that I've ever seen a child sit there smiling. He knew he was dying, but you know what? The chaplain downstairs, she took part in it. It was just the most fantastic thing. Every doctor that was treating him came in and wished him a happy Christmas. We kept the whole thing going and he died literally four days later. But you know, we gave him his Christmas and I still get emotional. <laughs> Um, I've put this on. This, um, strangely enough, I think is the most beautiful capturing of, of a good death. And I know that sounds very macabre, but there is a good death. And, it, it, and the departure of life eclipses everything. When a death is good, the room is filled with peace and all the pain that went before is forgotten. Where there is mystery, there is knowledge. Where there is fear, there is love. And I think that really encaptures. And strangely enough, that came out of um, the TV series, um, The Midwife. They used it in the last one. And I still don't know who wrote it. Possibly the lady who wrote the books, I don't know. But I actually just think that's, that's really gorgeous. Hospital staff. Um, what can I say about hospital staff? They pick up the pieces. They're short in the way of manpower. <laughs> They run the wards, they do the difficult patients, they do the easy patients, but they get stressed as hell. Now, through the friends of the Royal Free, which still exist in small, in, in, in helping me every year, they give me some money for, um, for, for use to, to give staff massage. And you know, it's the most valuable thing. We see about 2,000 staff a year um, over and over. We do do little touches when we're on the ward, you know, any of you that have been patients, and I can see some of you that have out there that I know, um, they do live a, a, a heck of a job, and they're doing a 12-hour shift, and they've got a, a kitty to pick up afterwards and go home and cook the old man's dinner. And, you know, um, it's such an essential service, and thank God the friends still, still help me on this, because I, I do think if you look after the staff, you're looking after the patient as well. And, and, you know, that's, I haven't touched on it, but we do look after on um, patients that are in palliative care dying, we do look after partners. So we'll take on the husband or wife, because often or not, they're going through such hell, and they, they're frustrating in not knowing what to do for, for their, their loved one. That um, it's really, you see this pleasing smile on the patient when we say, you know, why don't you come to us, come to our treatment room, come away from the room for a while, and, you know, it's something we can give to them. And they'll be stronger and they'll be happier for their patient once they've had that little session with us. Now, this is how the, how the service grew. From 1994 was my first year, 60, to the figure of 25,459. Now, this is when I got... 2001, I, got, I was in post. So I've been in post 13 years. And you can see how when, once I started to have uh, volunteers, it, it grows massively. Once I started to have four paid part-times, it grows even more. Um, so that's 2014 figure, 25459. And this is some of the breakdown. I've given you the mace one. Oncology and haematology, 9,063 treatments. Care of the elderly and dementia, 3,768. Renal dialysis, and thank, thank you, David, that's in the audience, who, who have worked with us, 4,053 treatments. Liver patients, 1,963. Scleroderma, as I said, we do have a lot of work with them, 1,418. Grants and donations achieved in 2012-2013. Royal Free Charity gave us 55,000. Friends of the Royal Free, 7,000. Karen Morris Trust, which is for... Um, Karen, uh, Sylvia Morris lost her daughter Karen and she set up a trust fund and they have given us over the seven years I think about, oh, I'm trying to think now, hundred, about 120,000 um, just for care of haematology patients, hence why I said to you we have two dedicated haematology therapists because they've made that possible that I can do that 
um, because there's no other discipline that has the same therapist, I'm afraid. Kidney Patients Association, wonderful David, 4,000. Liver Patients Association, 2,800. Royal Free Trust for Dementia, which was a one-off, 5,000, which was supposed to be 2011, and we didn't get it till 2012. Now, personal donations, teaching, walks, marathons, 48,000 with our little envelopes with people like Steve, who I'll talk about later, who's running a half marathon to, to, to keep us going. So total donations were 131,000 um, for that year. Yeah, I did get one, and I can show you I do wear a suit sometimes. <laughs> um, so with, I, I'm just finalising, before we give questions and that, is that um, it's not sustainable what we do. I, I am the paid therapist by the trust. I, I am the only paid therapist by the trust on a band seven. Everybody else is funded through those donations that you see. And I feel as we've got to 25,000 patients that it's, it's time that it was looked at a little bit more in depth. Um, because I'm 64. I could get knocked over in the street quite easily like anybody else could. And there is absolutely no deputy. Um, I have the most loyal staff, but they've only got money. They've only got jobs while there's money in Fund 270, which is obviously my fund with the Royal Free Charity. You know, it, I, I'm passionate, as you can see, <laughs> um, about keeping everything going, but it's got harder and harder. Not one of you, I'm sure, has turned on the television and seen how many people want two pounds, three pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds for the cat, the dog, the water. Um, gift aid, children's aid, everything aid. And, you know, it, I think we've proved our worth. I, I really think in our figures, uh, we are an essential part of world-class care. We're an essential part of making a patient feel comfortable in this building. Um, and, you know, my, my plea is that a fairy godmother will be found one day and I won't have to spend now probably my week I spend, out of my 36 hours that I work, I probably spend 15 to 16 hours uh, writing begging letters. And you know, it, what I set up, I never thought I'd be sitting writing begging letters. I want to do massage. That's what these hands were, were for. And so that's my, dis not disappointment, but my plea for the future of, of keeping this, this service, which patients adore. I mean, absolutely adore. If I showed you how many letters we get and, you know, the, the love that is shown back to us. And as I say, you know, why should my therapist only work voluntary? You know, you wouldn't expect a cleaner to work on the ward for no money. Um, why should my therapist work on a ward for no money? But there is a passion, and I told you, it is addictive. I did it for eight years. So when any, any volunteer says to me, oh, you don't know what it's like to be a volunteer, I do. I did it for eight years. But that's not an answer to the problem. I mean, you know, as we get busier, um, Barnet's just around the corner um, next week. Now, I'm waiting for that thought of, what are you going to do there? You know, I, I'm, I'm in fighting to stay alive here, let alone work in Barnet. But, you know, really, I think all I've tried to open to you tonight is to show you it, it is a little bit of a hand massage or a shoulder massage or a foot massage. But it's much more than that if you ask any of a patient that's seen us. Um, it is, it's a very powerful thing that we, we, are, we are enabled to do and allowed to do. And thank you for listening and I'll take as many questions as you like.